Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. Are you apprehensive about the quiz you're about to have to take? I should always going to be a quiz. Uh, I didn't realize I'm, there was going to be a quiz. I'll take I'm enjoying the quiz. them. I'm enjoying them when I administer them. So am I. Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, so I don't expect you to be able to, re to name this person, so I'm going to give you a multiple choice. Uh, just a multiple choice on him. Okay, see this guy here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. He is A, winner is of this year's Eurovision Song Contest. He's he's a Russian blogger who got fired after talking to Putin's chef. You know, it's funny because uh, the next, uh, the B, the B choice is, he is the interdenominational chaplain of the Wagner Group who was fired for saying that members of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church don't go to heaven. Or C, if you'd like to go with the one you volunteered, that's fine. Do you want to go with that before I get to C? Well, I know, because it might not be one of the four choices. So why shouldn't I? Or C, or C a neo-Nazi who, along with some other neo-Nazis, uh, and with the assistance of no small amount of uh, American military equipment, Stage an incursion into Russia, killed some people, withdrew under fire earlier this week. A, B, C. Oh, you, I don't have a D? No. And look, well, you can use yours as a D. That was good because there was a no. blogger who was fired. For, we'll talk about that. Yeah. It's, obviously, it's obviously C because that's what you wrote your, your column about today. Oh, you've already read the non zero newsletter? I glanced at it. Boy, that reading was fast. Is, reading is a term of art, but I. I, I, I read the first paragraph. I didn't have time to read the whole thing. Well, you're correct. Uh, but, but first, just quickly, I want to say that the Eurovision uh, would not have been a bad guess because he's also a musician who founded, uh, co-founded a Nazi rock concert uh, in Moscow, I think in 2012. And then in 2014, after the uh, revolution, he moved it to Ukraine. And so he's, the deal is, he's an ethically Russian a uh, guy who, like these other guys who stage this incursion, um, fights uh, under the auspices, or, you know, he fights in the war under the auspices of the uh, Ukrainian military. But in this capacity, they claimed this was just their own thing because they are also uh, revolutionaries who wanted to oppose Putin. Um, now, it seems pretty clear they must have had some uh, support from the Ukrainian uh, military intelligence and military. I mean, they did, as I suggested. They had like uh, like a dozen or so armored vehicles, uh, almost all American in make, and apparently supplied by the American military, not just Humvees, but more sophisticated things. Um, and they just about had to get them from the Ukrainian military. So, you know, uh, I'm kind of bothered by this personally. Uh, the um and, when you mentioned he, the, yeah ahead. when you mentioned the 2014 revolution what revolution was that in ukraine the deposing of the of the pro russian uh, president oh, oh the maidan thing. the violent okay. uh, deposing yeah. of it, yeah yeah okay um so after that they found uh, ukrainian friendlier ukraine friendlier territory i guess so um and it turns out these guys and and this was a major element in the incursion i mean there were two groups behind this uh, they both kind of called themselves Russian revolutionaries, although they're in Ukraine and associated with the Ukrainian military. Uh, and one of the groups is, is run by a guy who's himself like a notorious, uh, neo-Nazi. Um, this guy, uh, whose picture I showed you started an organization that is itself notorious. It declared, uh, oh, here's another multiple choice. Who did it declare a hero? Donald Trump. Donald Trump, David Duke, Timothy McVeigh. Uh, it's, it was obviously one of the latter two. Correct. Timothy uh, McVeigh, I'll say, give it to you. I was Timothy McVeigh, okay. And the point is, I mean, so our, our armored vehicles are being given apparently by the Ukrainian military to neo-Nazis who A, consider Timothy McVeigh a hero, and B, are, are, are staging these incursions uh, that the Biden administration absolutely does not want them to stage. I mean, it didn't have the nerve to flat out condemn it, but it did 
do this kind of passive aggressive leak uh, signaling condemnation and concern uh, in, in the New York mm -hmm. Times. And why is it, and why is it so terrible? Russia invaded their country. Why can't they invade Russia? Oh, they have every moral right to invade uh, Russia's territory. But uh, the the um, I just don't want to have a nuclear war, and I don't want NATO to get involved in the war. And in today's non-zero newsletter, I explain why I think this makes both of those uh, more likely. But but the other thing is just like they know the Ukrainian military knows Biden doesn't want this to happen. But they have figured out that it's easier to get uh, forgiveness and permission. And um, I, you know, we're about to give them F-16s and, and, and they are just blowing through all the red lights. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, it's just it's just uh, I find it uh, genuinely concerning. Now, I, I don't in the newsletter, I don't argue that it greatly increases the chances of nuclear war or NATO getting into this, um, but I think it increases them. And, you know, it does it in various ways. I won't bore you with the argument. It's in the newsletter. Uh, but 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 just 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 focus on the fact that that they know the Biden administration doesn't want this to happen. And they're I mean, just they're like, must... fuck you. We're leading you around by the nose. We've got you. True. There must be uh, there must be red lines that they haven't crossed. Um, we don't know what they are, but. but well, uh... Yeah, I mean, they haven't used Western supplied tanks. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's lots they of have things. An, they have they did conducted. have a tank, but it wasn't what they did bring a tank across the border. They have it was a Soviet tank. They haven't conducted lethal drone strikes against Russian civilian populations in cities. They no, but but I mean, Moscow. look, there's two things like Putin's uh, the doctrine he's articulated to justify uh, a, the use of a nuclear weapon is a threat to the territorial integrity. Of, you, uh, of Russia, okay? Border incursions like this, right. A. B, he justified the war by saying that when NATO sends all these weapons into Ukraine, which they've been doing, that was an actual threat to Russia. Well, now he can point to this and say to his people, see what I mean? We're under threat from the West. Probably be easier to get a mobilization. Uh, and C, C um, the, the actual grounds for nuclear, uh, the use of nukes, I think, uh, that are more likely to trigger it than mere territorial incursion, although enough of this could trigger it, um, is, is a threat to the regime itself. And, and this kind of thing is designed to make the regime feel threatened, and it may. I mean, you know, Putin will try to use it to, to harness the rally around the flag effect and mobilize support, and, and he probably will. At the same time, uh, it, it's designed to make the regime feel threatened, uh, it may have that effect in the long run, especially if the Ukrainian uh, offensive uh, has some success. And that is absolutely the kind of thing that can lead to the, the use of nuclear weapons and or uh, his his taking the war wider by attacking a NATO it, country. Isn't, uh, isn't the biggest threat to his regime his own guy, whose name I keep mispronouncing, the head of the Wagner Group, Prigozhin? Have I... Well, I mean, that's get, that's that's getting interesting. Uh, he, he is he is he is he gave a an interview, as I understand it, where he said, uh, uh, you know, what may happen is a revolution like the revolution in 1917, uh, and sort of hinting hinting at that it wasn't just uh, Jarosimov and the generals he was mad at, but he was going to the very top, and and sort of uh, people seem to think he's ambitious and wants to be out of Russia. Yeah. And now, first of all, I think that happened in the wake of this incursion. And I believe he referenced it. And this incursion, it may be the kind of thing that makes him feel more emboldened to speak out, which would make my point that it but makes it, Putin feel more that his regime is more threatened. Uh, but but yeah, Prigozhin went. Might, it might have uh, a, that might be a good side effect if 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 if, if it, you know, uh, uh, prompts a debilitating schism in Russia. Right. Uh, it's not impossible, but but what it definitely does, I think, is make the use of nuclear weapons more likely. It, 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 it uh, you know, I, I just I, I don't see how well, it, it doesn't. Be, it can be both. Actually. Yeah, it could. If there's a third option whose probability diminishes. Yeah, the the um, but um, no, Prigozhin, I had said last week that, you know, 
people say he's uh, dissing Putin by name. He's not. But this week, he didn't mention Putin's name, but he said things like, this war was supposed to demilitarize Ukraine, but now they have 10 times as many tanks as they want. Now, demilitarize is Putin's word, okay? That was a direct assault on Putin. He did say, uh, you know, revolutions happen. That was in the context of, of complaining that only poor people's kids are dying, only poor Russians' kids right. are dying on the battlefield. Um, but yeah, he's feeling his oats. And this suggests to me, I mean, first of all, look, he's not a risk-averse guy, so he may well be overplaying his hand. Remember, he did spend time in prison for robbery. Also, um, if, if he were in power, would the chances of nuclear war increase? He's for a bigger war. He oh, wants, he I'm want to not up. even getting that. My, my point is, if Putin's regime starts to feel really shaky, I, look, what would make it feel shaky, there's not going to be enough border incursions for him to think that these, these, cl these neo-Nazi clowns are actually going to start a revolution. What's going to make it feel shaky is maybe some of this kind of stuff and some of these interior drone attacks, yes, but all combined with a lack of success on the battlefield, okay? But That's what's going to do it. And, and, and if you ask, how is Putin going to respond to that? A good chance of lashing out. There's a good interview that I reference in the newsletter in Responsible Statecraft by Connor Eccles with a, a, a retired brigadier general who was uh, attache, uh, defense attache to Moscow, who says he thinks uh, the, the chances of a nuclear strike by Putin are 50 percent. Um, I thought I thought the, 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 the conventional wisdom was Putin could survive withdrawing from Ukraine. He just said, OK, uh, you know, I'm my. We're, 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 I, I have some fig leaf victory. We're going to keep Crimea, uh, blah, blah, blah. And, and we're going to negotiate an end to this war with, with just some fig leaf victory. Uh, is, is he going to fall after that? I oh, want, yeah, the, want the Russian public breathe a sigh of relief? It's easy to find people who will say that. The Michael McFalls, the Ann Applebaums, uh, precisely the people whose judgment you should not trust. No, they say he's going to fall. And they're well, but not as a result of mere withdrawal, right? McFall's not. Mc I, I thought the idea was that if, if we drive the Russians entirely out of Ukraine, Putin will fall. And the, yeah, well, I mean, if, look, he's going to know when he's feeling insecure. That's when he's most likely to lash out, okay? Right. Uh, this guy's not going down without a fight. I mean, what do they think, you know? Um, leaving aside the assumption that, you know, after, after, <laughs> you know, after every regime change attempt we've been engaged in over the tw last 20 years with the support of the Ann Applebaums and the Jeff Goldbaums has gone disastrously awry, okay, Iraq, Libya, Syria, they still do this magical thinking, well, everything will work out fine this time. Although some of the extremists actually hope that Russia itself will dissolve into chaos. I don't know what they're the first. The first Serb intervention did not result in a big disaster. I don't think. I didn't mention that one. That that. Uh, you oh, said you mean, every. You, you mean Kosovo? You said every. No, Kosovo was is more questionable. The the the, the first one fight fighting over Bosnia. Uh, Bosnia, yeah. Well, I supported that. It had the support of the Security Council, and it wasn't a regime change operation. It was a it was it was a truly limited military intervention. Um, it did I'm talking about the, the regime, regime change. You mean ultimately in Serbia? I forget how like uh, as a third order. Milosevic, that, Milosevic uh, left and he wound up in the Hague. I don't know. I don't know how yeah. quickly that happened. Yeah. Um the the uh well Kosovo is is a different matter. I I I did not approve of that. But look, the, you know, these people are crazy. I mean, uh and I don't I don't know which ones actually want are hoping that Putin will start feeling threatened and which ones don't. But if they think you can get all the way to regime change because of setbacks on the battlefield without the risk of him using a nuke, reaching an unacceptable level, they are crazy. And I'm not saying it'll reach 50%, okay? This general thinks it's already there. I'm not even saying it'll get past 10%. But if you think pushing it from like 3% to 7% is acceptable, uh, I just hope you have no influence over policy ever. You just can't keep playing that game without the world blowing up. Um, so anyway, I, I am really, 
I mean, this finally got a little attention. Uh, the, the, the fact that they were using these uh, American uh, military vehicles. The Washington Post, I think alone, maybe among the main papers, mentioned both the strong neo-Nazi connections of this group and the U.S. Uh, vehicles. Um, but by and large, predictably, the MSM uh, did not make uh, a big deal of it. I don't, I, don't quite, I don't quite understand how these vehicles are that easy to run. Aren't they, all these things very complicated? You need two weeks training to run them, and we hand it to any fascist, and they, and they take off at them. Well, remember, these guys who staged this incursion, who claim it didn't have the support of the Ukrainian military, are in the Ukrainian military. Their day job is fighting in the Ukraine war. Right, but they, they are technically a foreign legion because they come from Russia, but they are under the command of the Ukrainian military. So maybe Ukraine must have decided to provide them training. It implicates them even more. Well, they may have already um, known how to use these. Yeah. I mean, these aren't F-16s. They're these right. uh, things that they built for Iraq when they, when they after the uh, vehicles kept getting blown up by uh, IEDs. Um, they're, they're these, they're called Max Pros or something. Um, but there were, there were also Humvees and there were about a half a dozen of these things and Russia blew some of them up. But uh, no, these guys are, are, I mean, that's why it's so implausible that they did not, we're not coordinating with uh, Ukrainian military intelligence. They were. This is a, you know. The, um, uh, there was a uh, Ukraine angle to the DeSantis rollout, if switching to my neck of the woods. Uh, he, he said, and nobody picked up on it, that he was against a peace deal uh, done in cooperation with China, which seemed like a bad thing for him to say. He said that in conversation with David Sachs? No, he said that in conversation later with uh, Trey Gowdy, mm. I believe. Yeah, I wouldn't think. Uh, I wouldn't think David would approve. I wouldn't think David would approve. I don't. I don't know if David's influence is at an all-time high after the uh, botched Twitter rollout. Uh, well, I don't think it. I don't think it fault? did. Was that a well, Twitter it's, platform it's, issue? It's Twitter's fault. Yeah, but uh, it's Elon's but, fault. Blame Elon. It's Elon's fault. But Sachs is sort of affiliated with Elon too. I hope he's not Tartarus. I like him, but. Um, uh, it was a weird event. Uh, DeSantis, did you hear, did you listen to it? You, you could eventually listen. No, to it. I was counting on you for the play by play. Did you manage right. to listen to it, or did you? I managed to listen to the whole th all twenty minutes, twenty seven minutes of it, or something. Um, oh no, it was an hour. It was an hour long. So uh, it worked for you, did, or, or did you? No, they had, they had twenty. They had twenty minutes of of, of screwing around and false stars and talking over each other and having it, uh, uh, you know, glitches, and and then they decided to start over. And the second time they started over, it worked. And they went, they went for an hour, pretty much uninterrupted. Okay. And uh, DeSantis began it by reading a speech, which was a perfectly good speech to have read through the TV cameras at his announcement, but it was really weird and stilted over in you know, Twitter spaces. Uh, uh, and, uh, but after that, once he asked questions, A, Sachs asked questions that were not softballs. They said, you know, what about this Disney mess? What about... You know, uh, the book banning, what about this, what about that? So he asked mm -hmm. the hot button oppo questions, and then they brought on a bunch of uh, fawning do-gooders, fawning DeSantis fans who asked much more softball questions. But, uh, but DeSantis' answers are pretty good. When he gets in the guts of talking about policy, and his answer on immigration was particularly good, uh, he, he, is, he, is both, he knows what he's talking about, he knows the details, he... Uh, he gives uh, relatively smart answers, and uh, and he delivers them well. I mean, one, you know, he, once he gets in that groove, uh, he he does use acronyms that the average voter doesn't understand. He talks about ESG and DES, DEI, and all sorts of things that I think most voters don't don't know what the hell he's talking about. He talked about mm -hmm. constitutionalizing the administrative state. You know what that means? Uh. No, it, it, it means taking the independent agencies, the unelected fourth branch of government, and somehow making them democratic by making Congress uh, democratically vote on their rules. Uh, it's a you know it's a it's a project. It, it, it's 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 something that I tried to tackle in the at, at the Washington Monthly in 1979, and the problem was if Congress 
enacts rules as laws, they can't be challenged in court, which is good because they're laws, unless they're unconstitutional. But uh, but there are way too many of them for our, our currently incredibly inefficient Congress to pass. Uh, you know, so you know, and, and in every you know, you look at what what we do with a simple a simple thing like work rules for food stamps. It takes two months to resolve. Okay, there's going to be one of these things every day or every week, and 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 Congress just doesn't have the muscle or the efficiency to do it. So I I eventually argued for amending the Constitution to make Congress more efficient. But DeSantis is going to try to do that without amending the Constitution just by dumping it all on Congress's lap and let them figure out how to do it. That's not a non-credible position. And it's it, he gets he should get points for tackling it. Nobody else has ever tackled it. But, uh, well, but he should Steve explain Steve Bannon it. said at the beginning of the Trump administration, Steve Bannon said they were going to dismantle the administrative right. state, I think. But that's different. Right. Well, this might have the effect of dismantling the administrative state because one... One effect of this might be that Congress would develop little mini agencies in every committee where they basically knew everything the agencies knew and decided what they thought the rules should be. And then the agencies are completely superfluous. You might as well get rid of them. Remember, mm -hmm. remember, technically, legally, the agencies are a branch of Congress. So if Congress just incorporated them into Congress, that would be perfectly constitutional. Uh, um, so uh, anyway, he, he, but he talks in... He talks in this not not jargony, but with with, with shortcuts that that the average voter doesn't understand. But he's getting into a good groove. He started to trash Trump. All the the never Trumpers said, "Oh, he's never going to trash Trump. He's going to suck up to the man." No, he's he's trashing Trump fairly effectively, mm -hmm. uh, I think. And uh, you know, most most signals are good at this point. I have a question. I heard him do doing this riff where he said. We're fighting the woke in the schools. We're fighting the woke. In the, has anybody, and he went through with all the, has anybody done a mashup with Churchill's speech? We'll fight them on the beaches. Well, like, this would be good. I mean, it was, it, 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 you, somebody's got to do that. Uh, and, I, and I'm not sure it would work to DeSantis's favor. But here's my question. Like, snafus aside, would it not have been smarter to launch on Fox News? Like, isn't that exactly the audience he needs to convince if he's going to make initial inroads in Trump's numbers? I think he doesn't trust Fox with good reason. Uh, you never know which way they're going to go. Uh, and and, and um, uh, yes, but he. I th so I think he wants independence from the the, the dominant media, as it's, it's called now, mm -hmm. instead of the mainstream media. Uh, but uh, it would be smarter to launch on TV somewhere. Maybe launch on maybe launch in a rally and invite Fox, give special coverage or something, you know. But invite other people too. Uh, it's it, 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 and then and then he can do Elon Musk thing. But Musk obviously wanted the exclusive, and he may need Musk. So you know, maybe mm -hmm. it was worth sucking up to Musk. I mean, needless to say, the MSM took advantage of the opportunity of this snafu. To kind of lead with a snafu, uh, the uh, the one exception was the BBC. They actually led with the fact that DeSantis had announced, and then they got into the snafu later. Um, but uh, well, it, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, he obviously has problems with uh, the likability factor, and his per his permanent resting face is a scowl. At least it was on Fox News. Totally. He can improve that. Uh, I remember when Kareem Abdul-Jabbar first came to the Lakers, uh, he was he was sort of a, a pissed off. He seemed like a pissed off, angry guy. Didn't like playing basketball. You know, he happened to be the best basketball player in the world. Damn it! So he had to play basketball. But uh, you know, he had a permanent scowl. And then all of a sudden, some PR guy got to him and said, "Smile, Kareem." And then he started smiling and being happy, and he became much more popular. Okay, all it takes is smiling sometimes. So. DeSantis can change his facial composure, and he has to come up with some gimmick where he says, you know, I may not be lovable, but damn it, I get the job done. Uh, and yeah, Peggy, you're right. Peg Actually, he does need to turn uh, this bug into a feature somehow. You're exactly, yeah. you're exactly right. Well, Pe Peggy Noonan had some jokes. He should say, you know, I got this done. Must have been my charm or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, so and it, it, it's not something that's going to, 
Uh, it, the, the trouble is you keep looking for a double bang shot that rescues him from the likability charge and also attacks Trump. And it's very hard to come up with a, a word. You know, we could say, you could say, I'm not, I'm not polished. Well, I guess that's right. But it, it, it draws attention to all the things Trump does. Like he has, a, he tells jokes and he's funny and he's entertaining that DeSantis isn't. So you don't, you just give up on that. Just, just mm -hmm. defuse the likability thing. Uh, and, and also when he talks informally, he's, he's much, much better. The, 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 we will fight them on the beaches thing. Uh, he's not as good. Uh, he, this would be a great mashup. I'm telling you. <laughs> he said, if he said, you know, he, he, there's one point where he's talking, he said, well, I, he was talking to Eric Erickson. He said, well, I don't know why Trump attacks me with that because I'm more conservative on this, this, and this, you know, and, and he can also jujitsu the attention Trump has paid it to him. So Trump can't ignore him after pouring millions of dollars into attacking him for weeks and weeks. Trump can't then say, okay, I'm not paying any attention to Ron DeSantis. Trump obviously thinks he's important, so we should pay attention to what DeSantis says back to Trump. Hard not to cover that. I mean, the problem with turning the, the bug into a feature is, you know, okay, Peggy Noonan can write you a great line and you can repeat it. But to really make it work, I think you have to have some semblance of a sense of humor. And I'm awaiting the evidence. I mean, if there's any evidence out there that this guy has a sense of humor, I, I, I challenge you to deliver it by next week's podcast. He, Anything he, he's he, ever said in his whole life. Oh, he tracked, he, 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 he tried for humor in the, uh, in the Twitter thing when Thomas Massey uh, got up and um, what, what was it? Uh, it there, there was something where he, um, he was praising Elon Musk's, uh, I guess, for, for pioneering the electric car. And he said, he, Ma Massey I, I, was? Or, Massey, or and he said, I bought yeah. the first Tesla when it came out, you know, and now yeah. I've, uh, now I've, I've, I've turned into a generator is running my house, uh, you know? Uh, so, and then, um, and then what did DeSantis and then, and say? DeSantis said, but I've seen your license plate. It says Kentucky coal. And everybody laughed. That's not bad. No, that's not bad. It may have been, this, this guy has potential. You know, the it funny may have been pre-planned. Oh, you think, Oh my God, that would be pathetic. If you had to, if you had to plan just to get to that level of humor, that would be a bad song. I, oh, who knows? It could be say, it could be a joke that he and Massey have made to each other before. Um, uh, it didn't well, seem planned. Did not seem planned. I need evidence of a true, truly spontaneous humor. But um, you know, the funny thing is, I'm not feeling that anti-DeSantis because I live in such terror of Trump being president again. Uh, that even though DeSantis would have a better chance of beating the Democrat uh, than Trump, I just don't like taking the gamble of Trump being the nominee because well, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, you know, Biden. You're on no. the you're on the right side of the most interesting question now, which is the agony of the never Trumpers who are coming up with more and more ridiculous gymnastic rationalizations for why they are against DeSantis, even though DeSantis is easily the most credible way to stop Trump. Uh, you know, they, they're like David French had a column said, well, I agree that Trump is a unique threat, but this is uh, about the future of the Republican Party. Well, on the one hand, gee, Trump is a fascist uh, by your lights who is going to threaten American democracy. And on the other hand, we might lose control of the Republican Party. Gee, which is more important? Mm -hmm. uh, Tough one. Now, uh, what do they claim they don't like about DeSantis? After you tell me this, I'm going to tell you what some of them really don't like about DeSantis. What do they claim well, to dislike? They claim to not to like him because of his authoritarian anti-First Amendment tendencies. Bob, he attacked Disney for its speech. And he, he wants... Uh, These guys he don't give he a doesn't shit want, about that. He doesn't want social... He wants social... doesn't want social media to be able to de-platform and censor people as, they, as their First Amendment rights entitle them to do. It's, it's all bullshit. No, I think with a number of these, not all of them, it's actually about foreign policy. You know, the Bill Crystals. And when you look at these people, I mean, David French is a guy that Bill Crystal nominated for president, right? So we know he's Crystal-esque on foreign policy. A lot of this is about foreign policy. And that's why when DeSantis says what you said he said, which is that he doesn't want peace in Ukraine if it involves China, some of these people will start 
warming up to him a little. I mean, that, that I think this is a, that's why his foreign policy is a big question because he can. I suspect these people are scared enough of Trump, although even Trump turned out to be more pliable on foreign policy than they had feared. But I still think a lot of them are scared enough on Trump, about Trump that if DeSantis can reassure them that he, he will be militaristic, um, some of them may come around. That's my theory. That's a good theory. Uh, yeah. I, I detect, I suspect his reticence on the China negotiated deal is because he's more anti-China than he, than Trump. He's he's uh, yeah. Well, there, there was actually a pretty good article in the New York Times pointing out that Trump basically cut China a lot of slack, especially on human rights, while he wanted the trade deal, and didn't really flip entirely against them until after COVID. And 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 DeSantis is is against Trump on human rights and trade uh, from the get go. Yeah, well, for whatever reason, uh, after Trump got through with China, it, the, the standard Trumpist line was to be anti-China. And you may be right that that's what's pulling DeSantis in that direction on that particular issue. In other words, what he said was more about China. The, than about do the Ukraine. neocons not like that? I thought they liked that. Yeah, they hate China. Yeah, so. They hate everyone. They're hawks. They want as many wars as possible. Pacific, well, Atlantic, you know. Um, so yeah, the uh, and, and that's is why. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll uh, you know, I, I continue to not believe that that DeSantis um, ever had any any sincere uh, opposition to standard blob foreign policy. He kind of acted like it on, when he was with Tucker Carlson, but. It's it is weird that that it, it, everybody is ganging up on DeSantis. It reminded me very much of the way everybody ganged up on Howard Dean, who didn't really present a threat, but he presented a foreign policy threat, and so somehow you know beating up on Dean became, uh, you know, a, a, a group effort, uh, especially in the press, culminating on when they made a big deal of the Dean scream. Remember he he let out that. that yeah that bellow or whatever it was at the end of Iowa. After losing, uh, After losing uh, in Iowa, and that just did yeah. him in, and they made a big deal of it. And so he was destroyed by some kind of blob. I don't know if it was the foreign policy blob or the Middle East blob or what kind of blob, but somehow he was a completely unthreatening candidate, I think, and uh, and a perfectly good candidate, and yet they they had to destroy him. The Sanders is sort of in the same boat, and he may be taking steps to avoid that fate. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting he want, question. He doesn't want to be denized. Uh, although he's, in, in one respect, he's completely emulating Dean, which he's going to have 2,400 volunteers in Iowa. And remember, Howard Dean had so many, I guess they're going to be paid workers. They're going to have so many campaign mm -hmm. workers in Iowa. Dean had that number, and it totally alienated the Iowa voters. They were completely sick of the, these people in the orange hats running around. Uh, so... Uh, he, he's in danger of, of repeating Dean's mistake in that respect. Now, when you think about it, actually, this is his big wedge issue or whatever the term is. This is his, his the angle uh, of exploitation he, he can use against Trump is foreign policy. Because, uh, and it's ironic because most Americans don't really have super strong feelings about it, but elites do. And, and, and by the way, I think the Americans who don't have strong feelings Include a lot of the Trumpists. So, and, and that's why I think if he moves hawkish, and of course, the more he moves in that direction, the more anti-DeSantis I'm going to get. But but the fact is, if he moves in that direction, he probably won't alienate many much in the Trumpist grassroots. And of course, he doesn't have much of that to begin with anyway. But he does gain potentially significant support at the elite level in ways that could matter you know, in the media, in the think tanks, and so on. I, I don't if he, know. If he, if he combine that, combines that with things that actually appeals to the grassroots on immigration, on inflation, on uh, maybe oh, a little yeah. on COVID. I think the COVID thing basically shows that he knows how to run a state. He ran a very good state. People were happy to go there. He doesn't have to go on and on about Dr. Fauci. Maybe that's a sore spot with me, but he does. Right. My point is just that you know, the, you assume he will he will to make to encroach on Trump's turf. He'll emulate him in all respects. I'm suggesting that foreign policy is the one place where 
it, it is it is politically smarter for him probably not to emulate him and he won't pay a big uh price with the grassroots and he'll that's a good he'll, point yeah i mean i'm sorry to hear myself making it uh because i i hope he's not listening <laughs> yeah the other thing that's happened is uh uh the, the press is paying inordinate attention uh and positive attention to tim scott there was an article in Politico that Byron New York says was the best analysis he's seen so far. He spent the first half of it talking about Tim Scott's chances. He Tim Scott has no chance. They should stop talking about taking Tim Scott seriously. Why are they talking? Do they believe it or they're just saying it? He has a lot of apparently Bush Romney consultants who will probably talk to a lot of reporters about how Scott's going to pull this off. It's all bullshit and they're getting paid for it. But, uh, but, um, what are his uh, politics? But the, the press can't help but repeat them to at least to maintain them as a source for future stories. Does he have foreign policy views? I mean, he's just straight blah. I don't know. I think he's. I think he's a blank slate. Okay. Yeah. I think he's a. Uh, uh, I think you know he's 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 lovable. Everybody likes him. And what about uh, and, like immigration? Is he Trumpist on domestic stuff? Um, I don't know. Nobody knows. I, I doubt. I uh, yeah. I mean, I think he. Can Trump go likes way. him, right? Trump's being nice to him. Trump seems to Trump, want him in the race. Trump, well, Trump wants him in the race because he he splits the field and he attacks you know, all these people, like especially Nikki Haley, will eventually attack DeSantis because they want to be the Trump alternative. Also, they want to suck up to Trump and be the vice president. So uh, that's happening, and it, it's in Trump's interest that he jump into the race. Uh -huh. um, meanwhile, that North Dakota governor's whose name we keep forgetting. Uh, is jumping in, so what? Uh, maybe hell of a good foreign <laughs> policy. Uh, <laughs> but when David French says, you know, it's more important to maintain. Oh, you've already made this. Point. He's talking oh, about good. foreign policy. Yes. Yeah. Um, I and uh, that's sheer conjecture. I don't know that much about him, but I know that you know when Bill Crystal is saying this should be our next president, you can be sure he's a neoconservative on foreign policy. Um, do you uh? Do you have any views on the debt ceiling, which I hope will be resolved? I just by wish it would be over. I, I just I refuse to pay any attention to it. I assume if anything really important uh, happens, you'll you'll email me or something. I refuse to dignify these guys with my attention. Um, Am I wrong? There's an interesting debate over work requirements, but it's as I said, it's mainly a, a make believe debate. But uh, it, it's good because the pro proponents of work requirements seem to be winning, although the Democrats are uh, picking up a huge fuss. It's not, it's not a settled issue yet. But um, it, the, the Democrats, are, it's just astonishing that the Democrats are losing a debt ceiling debate. They've always won, and I, there's, there's even an argument that they purposely induced this one because they figured they could win it. Uh, huh. uh, and so far, they're not winning. Why you mean they're they're losing it because they're making concessions? That's the evidence they're losing it. They're making concessions, and they they because McCarthy passed the bill. They it seems like they are the obstruction that's preventing the federal government from being rescued from this default. Because uh, McCarthy has passed a bill that would rescue us from default. So, uh, and he's not running around like Ted Cruz saying, uh, you know, you have to defund Obamacare or do something unpopular. Mm -hmm. uh, they, Ted Cruz gave holding up holding the government hostage a bad name. Uh, it seems to be more acceptable than that. It's hard to come up with a solution to it because you don't, you sort of want some periodic check where everybody says, okay, the deficit's really big. We got to do something to tighten our belts. And it's not going to happen. You know, the tendency of Congress is when they're passing legislation, they don't think of that. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some time when everybody says, okay, now we're thinking of that. And, but you don't want it to be this brinkmanship. So uh, it's hard it, it, somebody smart could come up with a intermediate solution, but uh, I, I think it will be over. Hope so. The, the, Meanwhile, um, no hope of of anybody, uh, any Democrats entering the presidential race. Uh, no, there was one. Who was it? Hmm. Uh, no, not, not not a prominent elected official. That's okay. Anybody, I'll take anybody. Um, They've got my vote. I, I, I'm a vol I'm a campaign volunteer. You, you, I thought Marianne Williamson always had your, already had your vote. You both share deep spiritual. We have a deep feelings. spiritual bond. I mean, I did a podcast with her. People can look it up. It's on YouTube. I thought there was something special between us. You're free to judge for yourself. 
uh, personally, you know, I mean, look, you, you I'm not going to say more. I'm not going to say more. I think there's, a, there's, I do have a shot in a, in a Williamson cabinet. Um, Should there be one? Uh, you also have a shot in David Sachs' candidate, which there would never be because he was born in South Africa. Yeah, no, he has a shot uh, in a DeSantis cabinet. Yes, correct. Uh, but I hope he'll, uh, this is an alarm. Okay. Very nice alarm. Isn't it? Wouldn't you like to wake up to that? I can't hear it at all. Oh, that is very nice. It sounds like the music that sounds from the, of nature. Sounds like music from the movie Soul, which we both watched, which we can talk right, about. Right, which we're going to discuss in the parrot room. Uh, I also watched Dune. Well, that's a oh, surprise. God. Did you the ever watch Dune? It? Yeah, the recent Dune. Did you did did you speed it up to two times normal? It's the slowest fucking thing I've ever seen. You know, you should watch is either Memoria or uh, a, Tar a Tarkovsky movie. I think that's his name. Um, the uh, and that'll make you appreciate the, the breathtaking velocity of Dune. But no, you're right. <laughs> uh, but but the other way to appreciate it is is to preface it by watching 30 minutes of David Lynch's version of Dune, which isn't all bad. I mean, I, I I'm going to say some favorable things about it in the pair room. But you watch uh, both versions of Dune. 30 minutes of Lynch. Okay. Okay. This is a little, uh, what do you call it? An aperitif? Appetizer. Yeah. What is an aperitif? That's after That's dinner? That's an after dinner drink. Yeah. Okay. Then Dune was the aperitif. <laughs> and it was at least as much aperitif as any man needs. Uh, okay. So, patreon.com slash parrot room. We can also talk about uh, AI. Jeffrey Epstein. Wall Street Journal's killing it on the Epstein beat, man. Epstein um, Gates. We haven't talked about that, right? Epstein Bill Gates, the latest Epstein I, I, Bill Gates. I think I talked about it on somebody else's podcast, but not on this one. That hurt. But I've changed my position. I've changed my that really position. really hurt. So I, I now That's reject. I reject the position I took on the. the on the unnamed podcast. podcast. Is on this Ann Coulter? Podcast. Is this Ann yes. Coulter's podcast? Yes. Yes. Wow. Um, so um, anyway, so I will reject that position. You're going to make your huge apology. Or the just egregious mistake you made last week. About when 12 Monkeys was made? Correct. Correct. And we want groveling. No, we don't want, the, the we don't want one of these, these things where you preserve your macho dominance. No, we want groveling. The essential point stands, which is that although it was made 10 years earlier than I thought. And the only thing, two years after you wrote your article. Exactly. The thing you thought it was prescient for was some, a point I had already made two years earlier, even if we move it back 10 years. Well, as, as one of our commenters pointed out, it takes two years to write a script usually. So the guy started about, maybe he read your article, but he started two years earlier than that. And I didn't say he was, the, it's, it's the only prescient one. I said, it, as a film, it was prescient, as was your article. So. It should not be, be competitive with. Movie. I also want to talk about AI. You may have something to say about Tina Turner, who died. I, don't I do know. have something to say about Tina Turner. Not a lot, but I have something. And other things. I mean, it's a, it's a veritable pop culture festival. And maybe I'll dig up some more uh, trivia about these guys who uh, staged the incursion into. Uh, and, I, 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 and I can, uh, the, the real crowd pleaser is I can distinguish between two immigration bills that Trump and DeSantis are going to be talking about. Good lat one and good lat two. You laugh, but compared to work requirements, that sounds like nirvana to me. Um, okay, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, may involve work requirements, although I doubt it. Um, so, um, I will have the parrot sing us say, off. Say, yes. I think it's going to work out fine. I think it's going to work out fine. I think it's going to work out fine. That's killer material, man. What song is that? Is that, I didn't. That is, I, thought, I think it's going to work out fine. Is that you saying, I think it's going to rain from the Fantastics? Uh, I you think didn't. it's going to work out fine. It's my favorite Tina Turner song, but we'll get into it. Oh, it's a Tina Turner. Okay, we'll get into that. All right. Okay. See you at uh, patreon.com. Yeah.